Hello, and welcome to today's CE accredited discussion, Philanthropic Planning, How to Optimize Your Offering and Drive Growth, sponsored by Foundation Source and Schwab Charitable. This program has been accepted for one hour of CE credit from the CFP board and for one CE hour towards SEMA, CPWA, RMA certification. I'm Andy Peterson, publisher at Financial Advisor Magazine. Before we get started, there are a few things I'd like to mention. Please note that the information and insight you hear today are provided to you as an investment advisor representative and are not for public use. We encourage you to participate in the question and answer session at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A widget that appears on your console and clicking submit. As a reminder, Financial Advisor Magazine offers a variety of content, educational webcast presentations, and conferences on important topics relevant to you and your clients. For more, visit our website, fa-mag.com. Our speakers and panel for today's CE accredited discussion, Philanthropic Planning, How to Optimize Your Offerings and Drive Growth, sponsored by Foundation Source and Schwab Charitable, are Elizabeth Wong, who is the National Director of Philanthropic Advisory Services at Foundation Source, and Julia Reed, who is National Director of Charitable Consulting for Schwab Charitable. Thank you both for joining us today. We're excited to hear your thoughts on this topic. Before we begin, I want to offer you both the opportunity to introduce yourselves. Elizabeth, I'd love for you to go first, and then we can hand over to Julia and allow her to do the same. Thanks to you, Andy and Financial Advisor for hosting us today. We're delighted to be joining Julia and Charles Schwab in this presentation. I come to this conversation with three decades in the sector as a grant maker in institutional philanthropy and within the wealth management space. And now I lead a team of philanthropic advisors working with ultra high net worth families in the pursuit of meaningful philanthropy. We work with an array of foundation leaders that include wealth creators and inheritors, as well as corporations. Hi, I'm Julia Reed. Thank you, Andy and Elizabeth. It's great to be here. Um, I uh, lead the charitable consulting team at Schwab Charitable. I'm based in San Francisco. Um, I've been with Schwab Charitable now for almost 18 years in July before that on the street side and working for a small nonprofit called the Pacific Rim Foundation. Um, I also sit on the board of HomeRise, which is a permanent supportive housing uh, nonprofit in San Francisco. Our team works uh, with advisors um, and donors uh, to maximize their impact around their philanthropy. Schwab Charitable is a donor advice fund, and we'll talk a little bit about how all of that works and our role a little bit later in the presentation, but it's uh, great to be here. That's great. Thank you for sharing more about yourself with our audience. And now let's kick off our session, Philanthropic Planning, How to Optimize Your Offering and Drive Growth, sponsored by Foundation Source and Schwab Charitable. Today's agenda includes five key points, trends in philanthropy, what we are seeing in the sector. Secondly, integrating philanthropy into a client's wealth management strategy. Third, the philanthropic toolbox, your clients have options. Fourth, working with partners, strategies and case studies. And fifth, philanthropic tools and resources. Let's dive into the trends in philanthropy, what we are seeing in the sector. Julia, take it away. Great, thank you, Andy. Um, I'll kick us off with some giving trends um, some of you may have heard, um, but one thing that's really become clear, particularly uh, this year at Schwab Charitable, is that your clients are giving really regardless of uh, the market and economic environment. I don't have to tell um, most of you on this call um, that uh, 2022 was the worst year for the financial for the market since 2008 and volatility and uncertainty remain into this year yet we still continue to see giving uh, going up so 485 billion went to charity in 2021 um, according to giving usa which is a, a, a publication that comes out every july um, 
and in response also charitable donors have um, kept up with their giving and, and continue to increase to the tune of 4.7 billion uh, that went to charity from Schwab charitable donors alone uh, in 2022. Um, we continue to see donors giving both domestically but also internationally. For instance, after uh, since the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, we've seen 22 million as of um, as of yesterday, I believe, or today's date, um, go uh, to charities that were recommended by the Center of D um, Disaster uh, Philanthropy. Um, we've also seen an increase in unrestricted grants. 71% uh, of our total grants in 2022 um, went to charities uh, without specific designations, but uh, to be used as unrestricted funds. Um, my team, I mentioned, we work with advisors to integrate charitable planning um, into their practices, which is um, probably part of the reason that all of you are here today, in addition to the CE credit, is to learn how to best do that. Um, and of that 485 billion, 327 billion um, came from individuals. Um, so that really, that's, that number um, is more than private foundations, corporate foundations, um, and bequests combined. So that's 327 billion that your clients and you um, are giving to charity, which speaks really to the opportunity um, for advisors to have the conversation with their clients around their giving because they're doing it anyway. Um, and also uh, Schwab does a, a annual benchmarking study um, amongst independent, the independent advisor community and 85% of them are planning to or currently offering charitable planning, which makes it the leading value add service. Uh, that independent advisors are offering today. Um, so with that, Elizabeth, maybe you want to uh, hone in a little bit on ultra high net worth trends for employee. Thank you. Foundation Source has found that its clients are taking inspiring steps in the face of market challenges. First, they're pursuing a long-term view and remaining committed to their missions and grantees. In 2022, 74% 70, maintain grant making activities despite the economic downturn. And of those that made changes, 46% increased the number of grants, while 39% increased the size of grants. And looking ahead to 2023, 58% will continue to implement their long term strategy, and 43% are adding to their endowments. We're also finding that foundations regularly give more than the percentage required by the IRS, and asset size influences behavior. In 2021, foundations distributed an average of 7.2% of assets. In 2020, 6.9% of assets. And across those two years, smaller foundations gave a higher percentage um, of 8.9% of assets. Third and interesting phenomenon is that female leadership in philanthropy is on the rise. Over the last four calendar years, there's been a 32% increase in women in president and vice president roles in foundations, a 26% increase in the number of women grantors, and a 70% increase in dollars granted by women. In addition, we're seeing some really compelling programmatic trends. We've seen an increase in the creative use of prize-based philanthropy, for example, that recognizes excellence in work that has been completed and incentivizes innovation in specific fields. When a foundation shines the light on groundbreaking work and rewards artists, scientists, and change makers, for their creative works, discoveries, or critical outcomes, others are inspired to innovate in their own areas of expertise. One foundation developed a food prize that celebrates and promotes new approaches to food production and access and enables early stage efforts to go to scale. Another approach we're seeing is what I like to call the David and Goliath approach. When a small foundation recognizes a niche they can fill, 
that changes the discourse with modest strategic investments that shift perceptions, contribute new data to the dialogue and help redirect the attention of key players in that sector. They optimize their leverage. Take a foundation committed to expanding access to post-secondary education that recognize that images of college students are limited to just a fraction of the people who attend college. They went about changing that by broadening the inventory of stock photo libraries to include a much wider array of images of typical college students. They also produced a map of community colleges and the public transportation options for accessing those institutions to incorporate the question of how students get to school into the policy discussion. So we've touched on a number of trends. Now the question is, what do you do with this information and where are the entry points for the topic of philanthropy? We know that all of our clients are charitable. This is one of those topics. If you're not talking about it to your clients, someone else is. So the question becomes, how do financial advisors and wealth managers incorporate philanthropy into their practices? Include philanthropy as one of the core topics you discuss, alongside investment goals and planning for the future. Philanthropy can play an important role at all phases of your client's wealth trajectory, from creation to preservation to distribution. There are multiple ways to think about charitable giving and financial planning conversations. The first and most obvious may be tax benefits. There's no question that private foundations offer these from income and estate tax savings to income tax-free asset growth and capital gains tax savings. This resonates for some clients, but may not work for all. Certainly a broader approach is how philanthropy is a key tactic in your overall wealth planning strategy. Consider charitable giving alongside the myriad other wealth planning tools you introduce, whether it is insurance or estate planning. And finally, the one that captures imaginations the most is purpose. What role does wealth play? What do your clients want to accomplish with their resources, both within their family and the, in the community? And what do they want their children to understand about wealth? Advisors don't have to have these conversations on their own. In the same way that you call in specialists in insurance options or estate planning attorneys, don't hesitate to bring in expert resources in philanthropy. Adding philanthropy subject matter experts to your go-to resources deepens your bench and, and, and the value you are able to offer your clients. Julia, what are some other factors that advisors should consider when they're incorporating charitable giving into their wealth strategies? Well, <clears throat> I think we can all agree that with all of the, the financial benefits um, that, that giving provides and the tax planning benefits, giving really does start from the heart. Um, so it, that is, an, it's an example of, it's one way um, that an advisor can deepen relationships with clients because it provides an opportunity to talk to them about something, talk to the client about something that means the most to them. This leads to stickier assets, deeper relationships, uh, many times referrals to family members, friends, um, and potentially and into to other advisors like some of those that Elizabeth just mentioned. Um, but back to the, the financial aspects, giving impact, has a great impact on taxes, obviously, because the gifts are deductible from a tax perspective, but also capital gain, potential capital gains avoidance if the assets have been held long term. Um, it can be used in a uh, legacy plan, legacy and retirement planning. So um, it gives a donor an opportunity to establish legacy and carry a message forth into future generations um, of what's important to them. Um, and if you are involved in any of these areas in other aspects of a client's financial life, and it's, uh, you know, you would want to ask yourself the question of why wouldn't you also be talking to them about their giving 
if you're talking to them about estate planning, retirement planning, taxes, um, giving is woven in through all of those topics. Um, still, though, we do find that some advisors are not having the conversation or not necessarily having the conversation in as meaningful a way as they would like to. Um, and so I think, you know, it does help to have some tips and how to bring up the conversation without judgment from the client or the advisor for the first time, just by even sharing where you give, if you do, is often a good way to start the conversation or just asking them what they're doing philanthropically. We know that household, 98% of households over a million are giving to charity. Sometimes donors and your clients don't equate giving to their children's school or giving to their alma mater or giving to their church or synagogue um, with philanthropy. Um, but we're all giving. It's we consider it our civic duty, um, and um, it's it. You'll find, I think, that if you bring it up, that that clients are very willing to talk about it. And to Elizabeth's point, if you don't bring it up, someone else will, um, and that's a missed opportunity uh, for you. Um, I I would like to echo what Elizabeth said in terms of not needing necessarily to have all of the answers yourself, because I think sometimes the, the feeling um, that you need to is an impediment to bringing up the conversation. Um, and we have, you know, in answer to that at Schwab Charitable, developed some tools to support the conversation. Um, so these are actual tangible, tangible exercises and reading and reference that you can use to support the conversation that you're having with clients. An example of this is the Schwab Charitable Giving Guide. Um, it's a modular uh, tool um, designed specifically for the advisor-client conversation, and we even have created an advisor guide to the Giving Guide. Um, and topics include defining a charitable mission, creating a budget, um, involving family members in philanthropy, choosing vehicles, um, and finding charities that, that support the, the the, the interest or the cause that your client um, is talking to you about or is important to them. Um, so they can expand their portfolio of nonprofits around a specific topic. Um, the giving guide is very interactive and you can sit down with clients um, and you can walk them through it. Or if you determine that it's an easier approach to give them the giving guide and let them take themselves through it and then have a follow-up conversation, that's an, also an option. Um, it's very straightforward and it's perfect for an advisor and client that are just getting started on the conversation, regardless of where the donor is in their own personal philanthropic journey. Um, and once you've had that conversation with clients around your phil their philanthropic goals, you can start to be, then you can begin to guide them through vehicles and different strategies that they can, that they can use or you can use together um, in order to maximize their impact. So I'm gonna start just by discuss, discussing a little bit how we think about this at Schwab Charitable um, and what the toolbox is for us. And then I, hopefully Elizabeth can share the perspective from a foundation source. Um, so I mentioned that Schwab Charitable is a donor advised fund. Um, and I think, you know, that it's the fastest growing vehicle in the United States. And But we still find that some advisors don't know all about how they work. So I'm gonna take a minute just to walk through um, the logistics of the vehicle. Um, Schwab Charitable also, as I mentioned, offers resources, but the vehicle that we offer is a donor advised fund. That said, a lot of our clients and donors use multiple vehicles, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, a donor advised fund is a lot like an investment for an investment account for charitable giving. So um, donor advised funds are sponsored by 501c3 public charities like Schwab Charitable is, um, and uh, and donors can set up an account. Many of us uh, do not have any minimum. So Schwab Charitable no longer has a minimum to set up an account, which makes it actually perfect for someone getting started or maybe that wants to introduce a child or the next generation to their philanthropy, for example. Um, so the account can be set up with zero balance and then funded um, with cash or appreciated assets that have been held long term um, if the goal is to potentially uh, reduce taxes, deduct, or as we mentioned, avoid capital gains. Um, we also accept non-traditional assets such as real estate, privately held shares, 
um, you name it. So we really try to encourage donors to look as far, far across their balance sheet as they can for the most tax advantaged gift. They can fund the account and then the, the asset is uh, either sold and reinvested uh, amongst 15 investment pools that we offer, or you, the advisor, can professionally manage the account um, diversify over time, diversify, and then customize a portfolio, actively manage the account, um, and retain those assets under management, obviously, but also there's a potential for tax-free growth. Um, so the, the benefit of giving non-cash, low basis um, assets, combined with the potential uh, investment growth in the account, actually, uh, uh, we, we hear from our donors, they give more as a result of using a donor advised fund. Um, so once the account's funded and invested, the client can then begin at Schwab Charitable, our minimum is $50. They can make a grant with the click of a mouse um, directly from the mobile app or the website um, to any 501c3 that is eligible um, per the IRS as a tax exempt. So we do remain agnostic in terms of where our donors give from their donor advised funds. Um, we do provide these tools such as the giving guide in order to support that conversation so that when they're making those grants, they can hopefully be very strategic and planned um, around how they're making an impact regardless of which 501c3 is, uh, is part of their grant, grant making portfolio. <clears throat> Elizabeth, do you wanna um, speak a little bit about the, the toolbox at Foundation Source? Sure, thanks. Foundation Source specializes in private non-operating foundations and we offer administration and compliance services in addition to philanthropic guidance. So the most common and well-known tool of a foundation is a grant to a public charity. But within that, there are a number of sub-tools, if you will, that can be utilized to really increase the effect of those grants. The first is a proposal, a, a, a document that the public charity prepares that fully describes the, their goals and how they will deploy grant funding if it's offered, and a grant agreement which Foundation Source can help prepare around a shared understanding of what the commitment one is. Uh, foundation is making to a public charity and in turn what the public charity is committing to do. And then a foundation has the opportunity to use tools such as site visits or grant reports to really continue the dialogue with that public charity, that grantee partner on how the work is going, what could be changed and how to achieve the greatest impact possible. The less obvious activities that a private non-operating foundation can undertake are direct charitable activities, which is when the foundation itself, either their board or their staff, might engage directly in publicly uh, beneficial activities themselves. A foundation can uh, commission research uh, and do a landscape study on an issue area that they're particularly committed to. Um, they can also run um, a, a school supply backpack packing event, for example. So foundations can do things themselves in addition to providing the financial resources to do them. Another interesting tool is program-related investments, and it's that it has that word investment. And unlike a grant where the financial uh, support uh, goes out the door and never comes back, a PRI. Um, offers a below market rate loan to a public charity uh, doing really important work where uh, a loan could help them expand what they do. And other opportunities are scholarships and grants to individuals. So we talked about a couple of common vehicles, the, the donor advised fund and the private non-operating foundation, but the truth is that nearly all ultra high net worth individuals utilize more than one and often in tandem with one another. In our case, more than 50% of foundation source clients utilize donor advised funds as part of their giving strategies. In cases where a foundation's mission, for example, is clearly and publicly defined, 
DAFs enable board members to support issues of personal interest to them without appearing to depart from the foundation's key priorities. Julia, what about some examples that come to mind for you? Yeah, similarly, we see particularly with ultra high net worth families, the use of multiple vehicles at once. It's definitely a trend. It includes foundations, operating foundations, non-operating foundations, donor advised funds. They may also use the donor advised fund at a community foundation uh, in concert with a donor advised fund at Schwab Charitable or another national uh, provider. So uh, we also see split interest vehicles like charitable trusts in use, um, and um, and many times there's there's really a symphony of giving um, happening depending on what the tax situation um, is of the client. But one example specifically that comes to mind of using foundation and donor advised fund together, non-operating foundation, is we had a donor who. Um, was very happy, and actually, I should point out that you know, if if you have questions about when does it make sense for a client to set up one vehicle or the other, um, you know, I've heard people use dollar figures. I really would encourage you to think more about what the client's needs and preferences are because the vehicles are different; they can be used together. Sometimes it's a combination. Um, but one example that comes to mind is a donor that uh, was new to Schwab Charitable, but had a, uh, a, a longstanding private foundation uh, and was very happy with the, the foundation. It was uh, 10 million, I think, was about the average balance year to year. Um, but he had come to a point where a business that he had built from nothing, um, an S Corp, um, was the asset that he had decided that he was going to give and see the tax treatment when you put um, a, a privately held asset like an S Corp into a foundation, um, the IRS says that you're limited to the lesser of whatever that appraised value is um, and your cost. Um, whereas if you give it directly to a charity, including a donor advised fund, you can get a qualified appraisal and potentially um, deduct it at that appraised value. So you would give him this donor in particular said, well, I'd rather put it in my foundation, frankly, because he was very happy with the vehicle, um, but the tax treatment was not preferential. Um, and so he instead set up a donor advised fund as a repository for those in-kind uh, units of the S, S Corp um, and um, so that he could take advantage of the tax benefits. So that's one example of when you would you know, one reason why you might set up both vehicles and use them together. Um, he could then continue to use the foundation for the, some of the examples that Elizabeth just gave, like program or mission related investments, grants to individuals, loans to charities, um, uh, and give uh, to the 501c3s um, from the donor advice fund. Um, so that's, that's one example uh, that I can share. Um, and, 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 you know, I think it's also probably a good segue into the next topic, which is on um, the strategies and case studies. Um, so we do um, at Schwab Charitable, we have a team called our Charitable Strategies Group, which is an internal team that actually does due diligence on um, non-traditional and deferred gifts that are coming incoming uh, to, uh, to Schwab Charitable. Um, but we should probably talk about a little bit about the, the benefits of giving non-cash. Why, uh, I talked a little bit about this earlier, why would a donor give non-cash? Um, and the reason is that they, there's sort of twofold, which is that if they've held the asset longer than one year, um, then they, they, when, they, when the chair, they move it in kind to the charity, like a donor advised fund, the donor advised fund or other charity sells the asset because they're tax exempt, they don't pay taxes, right? And But then the donor can still take a fair market value deduction based on that qualified appraisal, um, or if it's publicly traded, whatever the, the fair market value is, the average of the high and the low on the day that they're moving those assets into, uh, into the donor advised fund or other charity. Um, throughout 2022, about 60% of the assets that we saw coming into the donor advised fund were non-cash, the vast majority of that being publicly traded securities. Um, as an advisor, it's very easy. It's If the assets are at Schwab, it's a journal. If it's an asset transfer, if it's coming from outside, 
Um, so it's a it's a a win win. The donor gets the maximum tax benefit, and the advisor um, is involved in the philanthropic decision making. Can can have a more meaningful conversation around the philanthropy once the assets funded. Um, the beauty of this is that you know pre liquidity event. Um, if you know someone's getting ready to sell a business or they have a concentrated position that's highly appreciated. Um, um, they're pre-funding philanthropy by using a donor advised fund. They get the maximum tax benefit in the year that they fund it. Um, but then they have a pool of philanthropic capital that they can distribute um, along with family if that's what they'd like to do over generations, potentially. So the account is designed to go on in perpetuity. Um, but as I said, we, our donors are very active. We believe it makes it easier for them to give to the tune of $4.7 billion in 2022. Um, there are considerations, obviously, I've touched on some of them, including the appraisal, um, uh, but it is important to note that these non-cash assets um, um, are can be given to charity. One thing I can point out, too, though, is that there are some charities, many of them particularly small ones, that are not equipped to accept. Um, so some of them can't accept stock. Um, most of them will have a brokerage account set up. Many of them can't accept non-traditional assets. So one of the benefits that we as a donor advised fund can provide to other operating charities um, is that we can make liquid of those more non-traditional assets um, and then fund in cash um, to the charities, which is the asset that they most likely, the, non the operating charities like best um, because they can put it to use almost immediately. Um, another great use of donor advised funds is for, I mentioned, deferred gifts, um, but also I think an easier way to say it is in terms of legacy or estate planning, um, charities can be named as beneficiaries. So you've seen this right with a, a retirement account. Some of your clients that are charitably inclined may name uh, the Red Cross, for example, as a beneficiary on their retirement assets. A donor advised fund or other charitable vehicle can be used very similarly uh, and named as beneficiary on retirement assets, which um, which is in in uh, posthumously makes a lot of sense um, because they are taxed at the income tax rate um, for the inheritor. Um, so it removes that from the taxable estate and potentially uh, puts a again a pool of philanthropic capital that that next generation can then give to the charities that they that they care about. Um, so that's just one example, but also. A donor advised fund or other charity can be named as the remainder beneficiary on a CRT. So it's important just to think about the charitable the charitable entity that your clients are supporting um, as, as you know as a, a potential component in an estate planning conversation as well. Thanks, Julia. You know our starting point is what does a client want to accomplish with their charitable giving? This can range from an internal goal of creating common purpose for family members or imparting philanthropic values to the next generation to external goals of solving specific societal challenges. Whatever the case, we're really committed to helping people identify philanthropic vehicles that fit their needs and priorities. The partnership we establish with clients opens with the vehicle. We set up private foundations or take on the administration of existing ones. It includes the day-to-day -day administration of foundation activities, supports the operation with a technology platform, and ultimately leaves us the room to support them as leaders of their philanthropy. And this can incorporate a range of things, often at different times in their mm -hmm. leadership. Uh, trajectory. So governance, for example, uh, how to operate as a board, what are the priorities and procedures of the body, how they can develop a strategy and then really begin to implement it. Around giving options, we've talked about the different options in the toolbox, but what makes the most sense and, and how might you want to deploy those tools simultaneously? Um, and, and, and how do you, as a board, um, you know, learn over time uh, to, to, to deploy various tools. And finally, and most importantly, impact. So what's the difference that the foundation is making? What can, what can it accomplish? And um, 
you know, figuring out the best way to measure those, those results. Some examples of how we've worked with our clients includes uh, partnering with a multi-generational foundation that was preparing to bring on a new generation of board members who had no experience whatsoever with charitable giving, let alone leading a foundation. We designed and delivered a board orientation workshop that included general information about the nonprofit ecosystem, the role that foundations play within it, and information specific to how this foundation operates. We prepared the new members to be able to contribute on the first day of their board service. We also worked with a client who was really excited about making grants, but also a little overwhelmed with where and how to start. So we offered step-by-step -step guidance that wove in their interests and what they were passionate about, but also gave them a way to operationalize their goals, how to identify public charities that align with their interests, how to approach them and talk about a possible partnership, what kinds of questions to ask, the possibility of developing a proposal, and then how to evaluate and vet requests for funding. Yet another client who is an expert in her field and knew exactly what she wanted to accomplish, wasn't sure how to communicate her goals effectively with her grantee partner and ensure that they had a, a shared vision. So we worked really closely with her on how to develop an effective grant agreement that included a robust proposal and description of the work uh, that would be funded. That's very interesting, fascinating stuff. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, you know, I think um, we've got a little time here before we go to the Q and A, and I think uh, it might be interesting if you guys could share, based on your experience working with advisors and donors, some more anecdotal examples, some case studies that we really learn a lot. Julie, would you like to discuss that? Yeah, I mean, I think I have a couple of anecdotal um, examples, I think, of using multiple vehicles, but we, I've shared a couple of them already. I think what would be also useful to this audience is what we see other advisors doing and what we've seen uh, lead to success around uh, the charitable planning conversation. So either those that are just getting started or um, have been doing it for some time, I would say the vast majority of the advisors that we work with don't have um, in-house philanthropic advisory. Um, some of them do, but most of them don't. And so I think to Elizabeth's earlier point of engaging with a collection of experts, whether they be, you know, just like you do with a CPA or, or attorney, potentially, you know, there are philanthropic resources out there like Elizabeth, myself, um, philanthropic consultants, community foundations that have expertise in working with advisors and their clients. And so I can't stress enough the importance, um, the, the important, the, the role that that collaboration has played in the successes that I've seen of advisors that are working with high net worth clients that are, that are, that are giving, that are giving to charity. Um, I think another best practice that I have observed um, success with is, you know, not necessarily back to this, this idea of not having all of the answers. You don't necessarily have to have an entire staff that has expertise in philanthropy, um, but just like you do with tax planning and estate planning, potentially selecting an expert on the team, whether it's you or someone else, that has passion around the giving conversation and, and basically turn them into an informal champion um, that is creating education, um, but also trying to stay on top of trends that can share with the rest of the team. So that's not someone that necessarily is dedicated to charitable planning, but is a subject matter expert internally, if you will, um, that can keep sort of a Rolodex that's not too dated of a term, of those experts that you can bring in depending on what the client's asking for, if it's the legacy piece or the or you know charity selection or some of the examples I gave um, uh, with the giving guide. Um, I think, uh, you know, 
I, I'll go stop there and let maybe Elizabeth wants to share an anecdote. I could go on and on. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <go ahead. laughs> well, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about the when to to talk about philanthropy and and how financial advisors can can uh, become part of that critical conversation. And one of the, the trends that we see a lot is, again, um, while all of our clients are charitable for the majority of their lives, um, the moment when they're considering a serious change in their lives, I think, is an excellent time to, to, to inject yourself into the, the conversation. And specifically, I'm thinking about a family that uh, had a foundation with us for a number of years. It was sizable um, and it was important to them, but perhaps not uh, on the front burner. Uh, what changed was after 25 years of running an extraordinarily successful business, they, uh, it was time to sell and, and to step down from the 24-7 uh, uh, nature of their business. And I think they, you know, as many people in this situation have, they had many options as to what they were going to do next. And this was an opportunity for us to talk to them about how the foundation could be both a receptacle for much of uh, the assets, should they, should they choose, but even more importantly, I think um, an opportunity for them to pivot what pivot around what their purpose is. Um, and this family has since um, increased the size of their foundation by tenfold and is spending the majority of their time really delving into meaningful giving. You know, a, a different example is a foundation that's been um, operating for some time but is thinking about sunsetting and thinking about making really, really significant investments in the community as they might phase out of this work. Um, and, and still another moment of transition is when the, the foundation may want to engage the next generation. Um, in philanthropy, we kind of chuckle when we talk about the next generation because that can mean people in their 60s, people in their 40s, people in their teens. It really means different things to different people, but at all stages, no matter what that next generation might be, again, I think it's an opportunity to think about expanding one's philanthropic footprint and really um, opening the doors for, for family members or others to become involved. Terrific. All right, um, are there any other anecdotal case studies that you'd like to share with the group because I think it's so interesting how you know every case is different and I think case studies really provide great examples uh, you know that's uh, how they teach in a lot of graduate schools through case studies so if you want to share any other ones I'd be happy to hear them. yeah I mean I can say in general um, this isn't technically a case study, but I think, you know, um, in general, the conversation at Schwab Charitable that, that the consulting team has brought in is usually, a, from an advisor, is usually around utilizing which what the asset is that the, the client wants to give, because many of them are planners, um, and they're looking from a tax perspective. They may also approach us around the vehicle. So I, I guess I'm just going through some of the the sort of frequently asked questions, if you will, that might um, jog some opportunities for the folks that are joining us today. Um, so the ask, you know, usually utilizing the best asset is a topic of conversation, choosing the right vehicle or com combination of vehicles, whether it's a foundation, donor advised fund, direct gifts, taking advantage of a qualified charitable distribution, um, giving directly to a, a nonprofit from a retirement account, for example. Um, and then the third piece that where we get brought in quite a bit is around actually ma maximizing impact with the grant making. Um, so, you know, and that's where these tools come in, right? Because we're not a community foundation. We're not telling donors where to give. What we're trying to do is bring them and their advisors tools to help them have an informed conversation about where to give. 
Um, and so things like, you know, finding and vetting charities around specific causes, measuring impact of a grant, um, you know, trust base versus being more specific with the designation. Um, so we're more and more being brought into those conversations as advisors become more advanced in the charitable planning conversation and they have the tax piece down, they understand the vehicles. Um, some of those advisors may be coming to us as a sort of centralized resource um, for information. And um, anecdotally, one of the things that we can provide, uh, we worked with the National Center on Family Philanthropy to, to, to uh, develop um, a, a set of roadmaps and guidebooks uh, that are specific to ultra high net worth donors um, around, you know, to help advisors and donors better understand what social impact strategies are out there, how they can involve the next generation to Elizabeth's point, um, you know, um, and things that the, the more complex donor is facing, particularly as they're, if, when they're giving in partnership, either with family members or friends or other donors, potentially. Um, so giving circles, things like that. So that's another resource that I think could be useful to an advisor that isn't necessarily a philanthropic expert themselves, um, or if they are, um, it's another resource to support the conversation. And what we hear from advisors, and I'm sure many of those that are joining us today, what we hear is that they, they really want tools to support the conversation. They want help bringing it up. They want help um, sustaining the conversation. Um, I think generally speaking, you know, to that 85% of advisors that are either planning or, or offering charitable planning services, there's no question that it's important to them. I think what, what our job is, is to bring tools to those advisors to make it easier um, to do it with every client. Um, and I think, you know, we've made the vehicle of the donor advice fund very accessible um, and lending itself to a multi-generational philanthropic discussion by removing the minimum so an account can be set up of any size. And we have accounts that range um, from zero that are sitting as a repository for some of those re retirement accounts up um, to um, much larger numbers. So um, I think, you know, there's nothing but opportunity for advisors. And I think uh, those are some of the things that we see coming up and some of the tools that we have created uh, in reply. Right. Right. Thank you for that. Elizabeth, is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? Yeah. You know, one of the, the questions that often or, or statements that I think a lot of advisors find when they talk to their clients about philanthropy is, I don't know anything about philanthropy. I know fill in the blank widgets, aeronautic sales, advertising, whatever it is their real expertise and profession may be. And what we found a lot is, uh, the segue that can be really helpful is in helping people that are that are shifting from leading their companies or running their families, uh, helping them understand what skill sets they do bring to the table. And I'll just mention one sort of fun example: a, a very uh, a prominent former CEO of a a brand uh, company. And, and, and his wife became partners in leading their foundation. And they got a lot of attention because of the, the brand association that they had. And they just said, you know, I don't, I don't want the attention for our philanthropy. Um, I'm, of course, I'm used to doing interviews all the time, but, you know, I don't want to talk about, we don't want to talk about us. And what they did in, in sort of, working with us and, and, and sort of thinking through a broad communications vision for their philanthropic work is they took every single media opportunity. They said yes, first of all, and they deployed their very well-honed media skills and pivoted those conversations to a discussion of the issues they cared about and the grantee partners that they work with. And so they, they essentially used their platform and their talent in, in sort of brand development, but just uh, moved the spotlight over uh, to the communities that, that really matter to them. And so again, I just encourage all of the advisors that are, are thinking about this today to, to take a broad look at 
the skill sets their clients bring to the table and how those skill sets can be um, really uh, poured into the philanthropic work that they may take on. That's great. That's terrific. Thank you very much, Elizabeth and Julia. Um, we're now going to transition um, into uh, the Q&A. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to uh, have everyone take a quick look uh, at um, uh, give somebody, everybody a little bit of time to share questions they may have and take a quick look at the resources provided by Schwab Charitable and Foundation Source, which are listed here. They're very relevant, obviously, to today's conversation. And these will be available to attendees uh, afterward uh, as well. Um, all right, we have a couple of questions here. Um, the first one uh, is, um, I want to talk about philanthropy with my clients, but I'm not an expert. Do you have any suggestions for how to navigate that conversation without getting out beyond my skis? Skier in the I I can start um, and just say it's a terrific question. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about it today. And, and the, the first thing is we're delighted you're thinking about this. Um, conveying the importance of integrating philanthropy into an overall wealth management plan is the first step. And demonstrating to your client that you are taking a holistic view on wealth from growth to preservation to distribution is essential. It shows immediately that you have the long view in mind. And with any other specialized topics, again, within, or such as insurance or estate planning, it also makes sense to let your clients know that you work with a strong bench of subject matter experts on this topic. And once you've anchored philanthropy as a standard ingredient in the plan, then by all means, partner with experts to operationalize what that looks like. It can only serve to, um, to deepen and broaden the value that you bring to your relationship with your client. And, and I'm sure any and all of us would be happy to help. Julie, anything to add to that or? Yeah, I mean, I, we talked a little bit about this, um, I, but I, I, I guess what I would add is that, you know, our team, I have a team of 14, um, and it, we have individual charitable consultants like myself um, throughout the country. And, and many of them have specific subject matter expertise in the advisor conversation and can hand deliver a lot of these tools and resources and talking points um and uh to advisors so i would just add that in terms of the that bench that we keep talking about um that we do have resident charitable consultants that are specifically designated to serve advisors of subject matter experts um, at schwab charitable right. right we have another question this one is more about timing i think um it is um you've mentioned partnering with experts when do we call you in So I would. Go first, Elizabeth. Oh, I, I, I mean, I, you know, early and often. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that um, the the time to bring in an expert really is before a decision has been made um, about what vehicle is the right one. I think that that partners like Julia or myself or, or her team or my team are really available to help talk through goals and to really talk about purpose and what you want to accomplish and then figure out the tools and the specifics and 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 all of the different types of financial uh, uh, tactics that, that you might use. So I think that, um, again, bringing in a third party to, to sort of help uh, set the set the stage for that bigger conversation makes a lot of sense. I agree with, sorry, the early and often for sure. Um, I think, you know, the first step is coming here and getting educated right on what's out there. And I think we've given some good ideas in terms of the tools and resources. I think um, we, we engage with advisors that are in different places in terms of 
uh, you know, we from from an advisor that has never had the conversation to a, with a single client to those that have in-house philanthropic advisory. Um, and to that end, the clients are many times in different parts of the journey as well. They may or may not already have a vehicle by the time that we our, our team is engaged. Um, and we don't have a preference. Like I think that, you know, we can add value regardless. Um, but with some of those complex transactions, um, like non-traditional privately held assets, um, which is an increasing trend, um, alternatives, things like that, the earlier that we can be brought in, the more we can help. Um, because in some cases, if, if decisions have been made and we're too far down the line, it could compromise the benefit of making the gift in the first place. So, um, and I think also one of the ways that my team can be of service is by providing education um, on a regular basis to your teams, um, just like we're doing today. Um, and so I would encourage you not to waste any more time and to check out some of these resources and in each and every one of them, you'll learn something, but also you'll be directed back to us. Um, and so that's what we're here for. Another question here. Um, once dollars are set aside for charity in a giving vehicle, how can they be invested and managed by advisor? Julia? Um, so at Schwab, I'll speak to Schwab Charitable and then Elizabeth, because there are some differences in terms of what investments you can and should use in a donor advised fund versus a private foundation. But at Schwab Charitable, um, we have I mentioned that we have two investment programs. One is a, is 15 investment pools, uh, zero minimum, um, and uh, the other is a professionally managed account. So at 200, I think one of the questions that came in was what was the minimum to manage the assets. Um, it's 250,000 account balance, then the advisor is not limited anymore to those 15 pools, but can customize a portfolio using individual equities and other securities, ETFs. Um, we also uh, have introduced private alternatives to donor advised funds at Schwab Charitable um, for larger accounts um, as well. Um, they're actively managed on the Schwab custodial platform, just like a taxable account um, and accessible through uh, the same systems. In Foundation Source's case, we don't custody assets, and as a result, asset, we're asset management neutral. Uh, this really frees up clients to continue to work with their trusted financial advisors to determine the investment strategy for their foundations, and that's a conversation that's really led by the board um, in terms of uh, establishing what their philosophy is, and then they're free to, to work with asset managers of their choice. Great, thanks. Another question here. Um, when a client grants to charity, what options do they have for how they how they are acknowledged and what is sent to the charity? So I can start. Um, so at Schwab Charitable, um, with each grant, so the first thing is that, and I didn't mention this before, but it's important for advisors to, to remember um, that, they, that a donor can schedule a grant. Right, so they can either schedule a one-time grant in advance. So this gets back to the timing and trying to get it done early in the year, not just waiting till the fourth quarter necessarily, which is arguably when we do the vast majority of our business at Schwab Charitable. So you can schedule a grant um, at a $50 minimum. You can also uh, schedule recurring grants. So if there's charities that you're giving to on an annual basis, quarterly, um, you can set it up on autopilot. Um, the advisor can also uh, opt in to uh, play that role as agent and, and conveying grant recommendations on behalf of their client um, at Schwab Charitable. Um, but in terms of acknowledgement with each grant recommendation, uh, the donor selects whether they want to be acknowledged, just like they select whether there's a specific customer designated purpose um, or it's unrestricted, they can also uh, decide to be anonymous with that grant um, where and or they can be acknowledged either by their account name, um, uh, the donor names, and they can even include their address or none of the above. Um, so with each, each grant recommendation, the level of anonymity is very flexible. Um, and if, if the grant is anonymous, it is entirely anonymous. There's no way that the, the charity can uh, can can actually see what the source, the actual donor of the gift is. We do have donors that will give 
be acknowledged for a larger for a smaller gift and then be anonymous for the larger gifts because they may not they may want to be entirely private and that's one of the benefits that a donor advised fund offers is 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 anonymity grant making foundation source similarly makes it possible uh is available to handle all communication and transactions with a, a grantee um, from check to grant agreement to acknowledgement correspondence we can uh, serve as your uh, po box and pass things along to individuals on the board uh, should they wish and there's also a receptacle for um uh for submissions if they just want to go and see what's come in from various grantees we also have a formal uh, technology platform of receiving uh, digital submissions in the form of proposals or applications and subsequently um, at the other end uh, reporting on the outcomes of, of a grant. That's fantastic. Thank you very much uh, to both Elizabeth and to Julia. Um, and thanks for taking those questions. It's really been an excellent conversation. Um, on behalf of all of us, at Financial Advisor Magazine, we'd like to thank Foundation Source and Schwab Charitable for their time and insights on this topic, as well as our speakers and attendees for joining us today. As a reminder, today's discussion will be made available on demand. To attend any of our upcoming webcasts, please visit fa-mag.com backslash webcasts. Please note CE credits are only available for live webcast attendees who report via our Continuing Education Center for up to 10 days following the live event. For more information, including frequently asked questions, head on over to our CE Center on the FA-MAG homepage. Thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.